views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Welcome to the transformative show, We Carry the Light, with host Dr. Susan Allison, the show that inspires you to find the light within and shine your light in the world. Who are you right now, and who do you want to be? What is it that makes you happy, helps you feel fulfilled, and living your purpose? Tune in and let Dr. Susan help you discover that you carry the unique light that only you can shine. Now, here is your host, Dr. Susan Allison. Hi, everyone, and welcome to We Carry the Light, and it's so good to have you all here, either live or listening to the archive show, and I wanted to remind you all that you can go to TransformationTalkRadio.com anytime, go to my host page, Dr. Susan Allison, and you can listen to all my past shows, you can download them as podcasts, completely free, and I'd love for you to do that for any shows that you have missed. So, um, yeah, I think that's incredible that that's available to everyone. So, how are you doing this week? I always ask you about your week. I hope it's going well. I hope it's all that you hoped it would be. And I have had a great week. I was on Dr. Pat's show earlier this week, and we talked about one of my favorite subjects that will be in my, my book that's coming out, which is... How do we overcome our fear of death and live fully here? And once we do that, we can relax and have an amazing life where we're not focused on the future and we're not at all in fear. And we also know where our loved ones have gone because it's my belief from years of being a shamanic practitioner that there is no death, that there, that we are immortal and our loved ones are also immortal. So mentioning my book, I'll just uh, re-mention, if you listen to Dr. Pat's show, you heard this, but it's coming out December 1st, and the title is You Don't Have to Die to Go to Heaven, and it's also about creating heaven here, and it's about being able to journey the spirit realms, visit with teachers, guides, allies to help you, you know, gain the guidance and the wisdom to live fully here, right now. You don't have to have a near-death experience, and you don't have to die to do it, you can do it now. So I'm very excited. The book will be out December 1st in bookstores, and it will be in warehouses in November. And I'm excited, I'm excited to share this with you and um, to fulfill my soul's purpose. And that is part of the reason I wrote this book. It's been my purpose to help people overcome the fear of death. You know, and I really believe that we're all here to fulfill our purpose. We're all here to shine and to find our gifts and then share them with the world. And I am lucky. I feel like I'm the luckiest woman on the planet that I have this radio show and I get to read books every week by authors who are also living their soul's purpose. They are light workers in the world and are here on the planet in this lifetime for a reason, and I believe all of you, all of you listeners are here for a reason this lifetime, and that that's important for us to figure out what that is, what the purpose is, and then to take action and to live it. So I feel very, very grateful to have a woman on our show today who is definitely fulfilling her purpose. I feel she is definitely a light worker, a light bringer to the planet. She is someone who shines her light from within her and shines it on others who are making a difference in the world. She is my friend, Eleanor Lacane, and I admire her so much. She is so inspirational, and we're very blessed to have her on the show today. So her bio is pages long. She has done so much in her lifetime, this, this you know, Earth lifetime, and I'll just share pieces of it with you, but... She's done so much. She's president of the Breakthrough Way, speaks and consults on breakthrough solutions for business, organizations, and government. Her book, Breakthrough Breakthrough Solutions, How to Improve Your Life and Change the World by Building on What Works, with an introduction by the Dalai Lama, 
profiles nine social innovations that dramatically improve lives and save money. These solutions are game changers in their field, and I agree. And I have my favorites that I will I'll share in a bit. So you can go to uh, thebreakthroughway.org to find out more about what Eleanor LeCain does and about the programs that she's endorsing. Recognizing the importance of good governance, Eleanor has worked at a senior level on several campaigns to elect quality people to government, including helping Elizabeth Warren in her campaign for the U.S. Senate and serving as campaign manager and issues tutor for author and congressional candidate Marianne Williamson. Formerly, Eleanor served as Assistant Secretary of State for Massachusetts. As the Executive Director of Blueprint 2000, she led the Massachusetts State Government Strategic Planning Process for the future of the Commonwealth in all areas of public policy. An early advocate of green jobs, Eleanor advised the Kyoto Businessmen's Association in Japan on green business opportunities. The National Committee on Responsive Philanthropy hired her as a strategic planner for their organization addressing the field of philanthropy and strategic giving. Eleanor gives voice to a vision of the U.S. as it could be, identifying the practitioners and innovators who are working now on projects and approaches that show the way to a new America and a new world. Wow. Hi, Eleanor. Hello, Sue. What a beautiful introduction. Thank you so much. I'm just so happy to be with you and with your listeners today. Thank you. I'm so happy that you're here as well. And I always start with the personal, and I would Uh love for you to share with listeners, because all of my listeners really like, you know, human interest stories, and and Uh who is this woman really, and how did she get where she is? So I'd love for you to tell us, when did you first know, perhaps, that you were in service, that you wanted to change what was happening in the world, that you wanted to be an advocate for social justice, whatever it is that you feel was the first spark, when did this happen for you that led you to where you are now? Well, I'm going to tell you the true story, which I've actually not shared very much with very many people in my whole life, but I'm feeling moved to share it with you here today. And that is, when I was about 12 years old, I remember standing in the uh, playground, Uh, it was just kind of a parking lot, and all of a sudden I kind of got this download, and it was this energy coming through like I had never felt before, and the message was very clear to me that I was to have a role and to help America and to help shape a new world. And the message included directives like uh, don't do drugs, don't um, do anything you wouldn't want to see on the front page of a newspaper, live your life respecting other people, um, keep your body, mind, and soul clean and pure and strong because you're going to need to have that uh, strength as you're moving ahead with your social change work. And I actually, it was such a deeply moving experience that from that moment I decided not to drink alcohol, I never did drugs, I didn't even know, it's very rare for me to drink uh, soda or Coca-Cola, and now we know how bad it really is for you. We didn't know that back then. I never drank coffee even. So, um, And I really focused from that moment on 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 service. I didn't know exactly how, I just knew that I was here to serve and I would keep myself prepared and and ready to serve in any way that I could. Wow. I'm so glad you shared that story. And You and I have known each other for a while, and I've never heard that before. And I, 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 I was just in a conversation with another guest, must have been last week, about children. And here you were, 12 years old, and it just came in. And I love the word download, because I think that's how it happens, that there's just this coming in of energy and wisdom that children, I feel, are so open to if if we don't squelch it out of them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I'm so glad you shared that story. And let, let's talk a bit about your book and about what what got you to the place of, of writing this book, I believe, in 2005 and then revising it. I I love this mm-hmm. new edition that where you've added you've added so much. 
how did you get to the place of writing this? Why have you written it? What's the purpose? What do you hope you know, readers take from it? Well, I love the question. I got uh, some guidance, and I've continually at different points of my life received guidance about what uh, to be focusing on and doing. And my guidance was to focus on this extraordinary moment in human history and to understand that we're experiencing systems breakdown now, which is paving the way for breakthrough. Yeah. And to help people see that even though it, it looks bad and the media is really promoting the negativity and the breakdown, yeah. that actually there is a huge amount out there that's breaking through and showing the way to, uh, you know, showing a better way, a way to a new community, a way to a new world. So uh, that was my guidance was to focus on what is emerging that's showing the way to a new world. And that's kind of how uh, I kind of got the notion to do it. And in parallel, I was hired uh, by the state of Massachusetts to do strategic planning for the whole state government. And I noticed that one community would have some kind of an innovation, like a better way of doing education or dealing with criminal readjustment in the community. And the town next door would not know about that innovation or not Mm -hmm. be learning from it. Yeah. And it really struck me as such a waste. That's like, why don't we identify the best of what's working around the state uh, and share that information across communities so we can adapt and adopt the best of what's working in all the communities? And and then I said, well, why stop at the state? We can be sharing the best of what's working around the country and eventually around the world yeah. so that we as a human community can be learning from adapting and adopting the best of what works learn from each other, and help humanity. And I think it's going to be the simplest, fastest way we can help the most people for the least amount of money is to identify and build on the best of what's working. So I went on what became a 20-year journey across America looking for the best of what's working in America. And that's what led to the book, Breakthrough Solutions, that you mentioned Mm -hmm. And I profile nine of those breakthrough solutions in there. And I see this book in a way kind of like Walt Whitman when he wrote Leaves of Grass. I think it took him decades to do it because he kept improving it and refining it and making it better. And that's kind of how I feel about this book. I think I'm just, this is my life's work to be focusing on these breakthrough solutions to show that we have solutions virtually everywhere and virtually every domain. And, and dealing with some of the toughest problems that are out there, we have solutions already. I agree. I, I'm so, you know, re, I mean, I read your book before, and then I just I read it again for this interview. And I love this. I think it's about how do we get this out, because the media, as you say, is so negative and so focused on what isn't working. And I, I can't even watch the news Right. Uh, I, can, I can't watch the news. I haven't watched the news in oh, at least a few years. I do read, you know, like I'll read the Huffington Post online or I'll read, you know, some things in the Wall Street Journal, some things here, some things there, listen to the BBC a little bit. But frankly, and I'm going to ask this now because I was talking to another guest about this, is there anything we can do, I mean, besides what you did with this book, to change what's happening in the media? Because to me, it's a huge problem. Yeah. Well, I think you hit your nail on the head. I would say the two of the biggest challenges we've got right now are the media and our federal government. Yes. And uh, they're both very dense and fairly toxic and uh, and hard to shift. Yes. So um, I would say in terms of the media, that we actually have the solution there already, which is we have the Internet. And yes. we we don't have to rely anymore. Remember the days it used to be the three major networks on television, and they controlled yeah. the news from there. Now we can have multiple sources of information. There's the downside of it is there's a lot of misinformation yes. and you know deliberately uh, placed misinformation sometimes, and so it, it's harder to know kind of what's the quality and what's real there. But uh, you know what we need to know is there we can communicate with each other through our websites through the emails you know through the internet 
that's going to be the way people communicate with people about what's really going on and what we can all do to help make it. And I agree totally with you that each of us has a purpose and has a role. And I feel like we're living at the most exciting time in human history, that we're really in the middle of a major shift, and each of us has a role to play in helping that shift. And, you know, we may not be able to change... Uh, you know, Fox News or whatever that's out there, but we can do just as an example with my book here, The Breakthrough Solutions, now your listeners know about it. If they read it, if they tell their friends about it, yeah. go to the breakthroughway.org. That's how we're going to do it. We're just going to create our own person-to-person media networking. Yeah, I completely agree with you and I feel that this is making a huge difference. And As you're speaking, I, I had Barbara Marks Hubbard on my show twice and, you know, a lot of what she says, you know, about focus on, you know, what is working. Uh, we're, you know, this is a conscious evolution, the first time in history where we consciously are creating our future. And I feel that the more we say that, people take a personal stand. In other words, you know, figuring out who they are, what it is, there's their purpose here. And then, as she says, taking action. Right. I totally agree. And, you know, with the media focusing on the breakdown, it can make people feeling very depressed and like there's really uh, yeah. and nothing much I can do and everything's going to hell in a handbasket and America is yeah. not great anymore, all of that. Uh, but the other side of that is with that sh- understanding that it's actually it's a good thing we're having some of these breakdowns because a lot of the systems that are in place, you know, service a very few people and we need some of the current systems to break down in order to create new systems that are in greater harmony with each other and with nature. So, um, you know, we need to see that these multiple crises we're facing, both personally and societally, are the drivers that will help us create a a new world, create Mm -hmm. stronger families, stronger communities, a stronger America, and a better world. So, we're, yeah. uh, I totally agree with Barbara Marks Hubbard. Uh, we can consciously create the future. You know, we are seeing that now more on a personal level, and what we focus on grows. Yeah. And, you know, we, we can consciously uh, create a lot of our own personal lives. And as we understand that more, it's like what I'm saying is, yes, that is true, and that's also true on a social level, that we can create the communities we want, we can create the country we want. We can create the world we want yes. by, you know, envisioning it, being clear about it, and building on it. And that's why I love these models that are in the book. They're practical, yeah. proven models that work. It's not just visioning. Visioning is vital, and we want to envision and hold that vision. And these are the practical, proven models that are actually working now yes. that show us that we can actually solve all these problems. That's exactly right. Well said. I would love to start focusing specifically. We could spend two hours doing this on a show, and we have an hour. So I'd love to jump in and have you talk about some of your solutions, some of your incredible breakthroughs that you've found that people are actually doing. It's not something we have to invent. This is happening in the world. So, I mean, I have my favorites, but I'd love for you to just intuitively choose one and talk about a breakthrough solution for listeners. Great, yeah, I love it. It's kind of like, you know, which are your favorite children here with this? And I <laughs> I love them all, really. But, you know, one that's coming up for me now is about uh, a crime and criminal rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. And it's actually, I think, uh, an area where we're getting the left and the right and the Democrats and Republicans are coming together. You get the Koch brothers on the one side and Van Jones and some of the liberal Democrats, and they were coming together around criminal justice reform. You yes. know, we now have about uh, two and a half million people in prison at a cost of about $70 billion a year for incarceration, plus the cost of building prisons yes. and the cost of lost lives. You know, people, what do people do when they come out? Yes. And And it's not really solving the problem in the sense that over two-thirds of the prisoners who are released will commit another crime and go back to jail. So uh, we're spending uh, tens of billions of dollars on the prison industrial complex, and we're not 
solving the crime problem. We still have crime. In fact, crime is up in many cities across America, and the lives of the people who go into prison are, you know, they're, they're not rehabilitating. But uh, there actually is a better way. There yeah. is the Delancey Street Rehabilitation Program in San Francisco where criminals and drug addicts can go and they turn their lives around and become productive members of our community. And by the way, it's at no cost to the taxpayer because there is no paid staff at Delancey Street. It's run by the residents themselves. They learn to take responsibility for their lives. They they actually teach them. It's like we were talking about visioning how you want to be and creating your life. Yeah. They teach the residents act as if you are decent, talented people, and then that's what they become. That's right. And they they learn three specific skills so they can earn a living. They have a copy shop, a Christmas tree shop, a um, you know auto body repair shop. So and there was actual businesses uh, where the inmates or the residents learn the skills, and each one teach one. The more experienced ones who have been there a couple of years teach the ones just coming in. And they earn, uh, they learn three skills so they can earn a living when they graduate from the program. They like to say it's like, it's a four year program like Harvard. <laughs> and yeah. then they graduate and come out and become productive members of our society and at zero cost to the taxpayers because the training programs that they have for the businesses are actually profit generating businesses that fund the whole enterprise. So it's a fantastic mm -hmm model for turning discouragement and despair into hope as people yeah. reclaim their lives. Yeah, and mention, I know I, this is one of my favorite chapters, so I'm glad you did this one. Uh, <laughs> t tell, tell listeners where else there are Delancey Street programs, because it's not just in San Francisco, is it? And also, you visited there, and, were, and you were super impressed with, um, you know, I think, you, you know, the food and the way that it was served and you know, how they were, everybody was being trained. And so where else is this happening? And is there, a, do, do, can people donate to this? Is there a way for just the average listener right now being able to be involved in this? Yeah, well, actually, yes, I did visit Delancey Street in San Francisco twice. The first time was with Barbara Marks Hubbard, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I went again, and it was so inspiring to see that, you know, I, you can actually eat there. It's a restaurant, which I encourage anyone who's in San Francisco to go to the Delancey Street restaurant. It's right on the Embarcadero, a wonderful neighborhood. And uh, the waiter who's taking your order and the maitre d' and the, the cook, everybody is a resident, and they're all learning a skill. And they were so respectful, and it was so delicious. It was just such a great feeling to know that you're a part of helping support this program. I don't think they accept donations. I think mm. that's the basic principle is that the residents need to take responsibility for themselves mm -hmm. and they have to not live on charity. Yeah. They have to, you know, pick up the uh pick up the paddle and, you know, work for themselves and earn yeah. the money for the community. So uh but for our listeners who think this is a valuable way to go, and, and I, I, by the way, I should say, I understand that of the over 2 million people in prison, there's not going to be 100% of those people that will benefit from Delancey Street. Yeah. I think there are some people who are just like so far beyond the pale that they're not going to recover and get back on a healthy track. So, yeah. But I would like to know, like, how many would benefit? Is it 50% of our current prisoners? So, you know, 70%, whatever percentage it is, we should be creating these Delancey Street programs everywhere. In every state, we should have one. So yeah. there are several out there. I think there's seven in different parts of the country now. And um, I, I, I think what a listener could do if you're interested and care about this issue is to uh, take this, first of all, learn about the model. You can you just read about it in uh, my Breakthrough Solutions book. It's a very quick yeah. summary of the key points on it. And when you learn about the Delancey Street model, talk to your state reps, uh, your state senators, you know, the legislators and your state, your federal members of Congress, and say, there is this model of Delancey Street. There is a better way, and you know we, as citizens, demand that this approach be made available 
for inmates because it's a low-cost, no-cost, much more successful way of helping people get back on the straight and narrow. I agree. And don't forget, uh, tell them your website. And, Eleanor, how can they get your book? Yeah, right now the book is only available on my website, which is thebreakthroughway.org. Um, I think if you search my name, Eleanor Lacain, L-E-C-A-I-N, you'll, uh, it'll also come up. But uh, I will be putting it on to Amazon. I think I'm going to be doing another update soon and mm-hmm. then uh, make it available on Amazon. Wonderful. We need to take a break. Um, and we are with Eleanor Lacain, and we're talking about Breakthrough Solutions and her incredible book. And we will be right back. The preceding audio was via a Skype call. The Women of Wisdom Fall Harvest Festival is coming up right around the corner on October 24th from 10.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. with free admission located at the North Seattle Community College in the Conference Center. Festivities include a silent auction, healers, educational booths, delicious food, and a variety of vendors. You won't want to miss this fun-filled event. For more information, visit womenofwisdom.org and we'll see you there. We Carry the Light with host Dr. Susan Allison is the show that inspires you to find the light within and shine your light in the world. You'll hear from guests who model how to be the highest, brightest, most evolved, fulfilled, and conscious humans possible. Tune in each Thursday, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com and let Dr. Susan help you discover that you carry the unique light that only you can shine. Tired of traditional talk? People pontificating about this or that, the left or the right. Sometimes the truth is just all lost in the noise. Tune in each week to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher on TransformationTalkRadio.com, Mondays at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, as nationally known guests talk about what's important to you, your life, your concerns, and your success. Tune in and turn on to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher. Visit ChuckGallagher.com for more information. Do you want to transform your life's trauma and challenges into the gift that your life was meant to be? It's time for you to take control of your soul journey to heal, grow, and shine. Manifest your destiny with Wendy Wolf, soul transformer, energy, and psychic healer. To start your soul journey, contact Wendy at HealGrowShine.com or email Wendy at Wendy at WendyRWolf.com and start your adventure today. How would you like increased health and vitality? How would you like to avoid the onset of disease as well as slow the aging process? This is all possible through a simple, safe, and natural process. Every day we are either moving toward wellness or away from wellness. Hi, I'm Mary Jane Mack. I'd like to be your partner in achieving optimal health. Contact me now at MaryJaneMack.com or call 425-392-0659. Visit MaryJaneMack.com. Artie Hoffman is the hottest psychic with the warmest heart and the host of the hit show Angels and Answers. A renowned psychic, medium, spiritual life coach, and an entertaining motivational speaker, Artie has helped over 15,000 people with his amazing intuitive gifts, his passion, and his humor. Call 877-ANGEL-02 to schedule a personal reading or to have your own psychic Artie party. That's 877-ANGEL-02. And visit ArtieHoffman.com and Angels and Answers on Facebook. The following audio is via a Skype call. I want to wake you up. I can hardly hear my... Welcome back, everyone. I hope you've been listening to the entire show. If not, you can go to TransformationTalkRadio.com. Go to my host page, Dr. Susan Allison, and you can listen to the show if you missed part of it and download it as a podcast if you'd like. So I am here with Eleanor Lacane, author of Breakthrough Solutions, How to Improve Your Life and Change the World by Building on What Works. So Eleanor is not only an amazing writer and advocate, 
but she has recently met the Pope. And I wanted to start there because I was just talking to friends about this Pope and how amazing he is. Eleanor, share with us this meeting. You met him in Washington, D.C. last week, I believe. Yes, yeah, well, I was uh, down at the United States Capitol when uh, the Pope came to address a joint session of Congress and uh, had a, a, a front row seat to the proceedings. And I just have to say, you know, I've been, I'm a lifelong Catholic. I went to Catholic schools all the way up until my sophomore year in high school. And I, uh, my sister went to Georgetown, a Jesuit college. So it would come from a very Catholic family, but it's been very, uh, you know, rocky the way the Catholic Church has treated women, and then this whole uh, abuse scandal broke, and it, it was just not a place where I wanted to put my energy. But this Pope, Pope Francis, is just an amazing being. Talk about a light worker who's come to the planet now to help uh, you know, guide the way for people. He is redirecting the church, I think, in a very positive way. He was talking a lot about, uh, you know, his, his shifting of the focus away from the social hot button issues and to economic justice, dealing with income inequality, dealing with global climate change, and dealing with immigration. And it's just such a thing. I feel like he's the closest thing to. You know, Jesus Christ walking on the planet now is Pope Francis. He's just such an amazing being. And what he said in in Congress at the at the end of this amazing speech, um, and he highlighted four great American heroes who had all worked for social and economic justice. Uh, he at the end of it, he says, you know, please pray for me, uh, mm-hmm. which is amazing to me. It's such a humble thing. And I thought, you know. Who are we to be paying, for, praying for this amazing, enlightened being? But um, I think that's part of his message, is that you, too, are a light being, and we need you engaged here. And um, and he can't do these massive changes all by himself, so he mm-hmm. really wants us all to get involved. Oh, that's so inspiring. And that's everything I've heard about this cult has been so positive and so inspiring. So how lucky that you were there and uh, could hear his message. And he does, what, I've heard this before about how humble he is. Yes, very much so. And I, I did want to address one issue I know that sure. came up afterwards, if, uh, that it came out that the, Kim Davis, who was the Kentucky clerk who was refusing to issue marriage licenses to the yep. gay couples in Kentucky and went to jail for it, the Pope did meet her, but what's come out, since then, is he didn't meet one on one with her. She was in with a group of people, and the Pope apparently had no idea who she was or the background of it. So it wasn't yeah. like he was supporting her. And in fact, the only audience he actually had of one on one was with a very dear friend of his from Argentina, who is a gay guy who brought his partner of decades uh, to meet the Pope. <laughs> so. I know it. I heard that. But you know, I do have a friend who was very upset about his meeting with that woman because I think that the media it was all skewed and it wasn't uh it wasn't correct reporting. Right. I think that's right. And I think in a you know that was he was kind of set up by the uh bishop who runs the nuncio here, kind of the embassy for the Vatican in DC is a very much kind of a right winger old conservative style uh and he actually had been demoted by this pope um, he used to be in charge of the group not, that's now it's kind of the the group that came out of the Inquisition. It was in, in the Middle Ages. It was the Inquisition. Now it's called something else. But this guy mm-hmm. used to head it, and Pope Francis demoted him, sent him over to the U.S., and he's the one that invited Kim Davis to the meeting without the Pope knowing what was really going on. So I think it's on his shoulders, and I think we can expect his retirement in January. Good. Good. I'm glad to get that information to listeners because I think people have the wrong idea about what happened, including my friend. So I'm going right. to have her. I'm have her just listen to your explanation on the show. Great. Yeah. And so I also, because we're talking about sort of disenfranchised people, we're talking. You mentioned gays and lesbians. Also, women. I know that you know mm-hmm. when I did my Vision Quest work, they asked us, "Who are your people?" And for me, in terms of my practice, it's almost all women. And I wanted to go there because I know all of your work. 
uh, with women and for women, and let's talk about about that. Sure. Well, actually, the uh, the Dalai Lama who uh, who wrote the introduction of my book, which is an honor that I am spending my life living up to that honor. But the Dalai Lama, uh, who I love and admire, once said that the world will be saved by the Western woman, and. I actually think there's a lot of truth. When I first heard that, I was like, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's some, I, now I know who's going to save the Western world. And then I realized, oh, wait, that's me, and that's my <laughs> friend. <laughs> it's like, okay, now what do we have to do to save the world? <laughs> it's, so, it's a little daunting when you ask about <laughs> really little, that phrase. Yeah, but... Um, I think we totally can. I think this is where the women, as you mentioned, having been kind of disenfranchised and cut out for millennia, uh, gives us kind of the fresh perspective and view. We're coming from the values. We're the ones giving birth and usually raising the families. Um, Connection to the children, to the family, connection to nature, connection to each other. Uh, And I that I think it is really women who are going to be mostly the way showers and I think we need to get the women of um, vision and spirit you know you your listeners together with men in partnership to make the shift but I think women are going to have to lead the way most of the time so I fully believe that and most of the innovations in my book if you know will uh, are from uh, models created by women and I, I am a strong believer if we uplift our women, we uplift our families and communities and countries along with it. So I've been doing a lot of work on, I've run leadership seminars for women to encourage women to think bigger and bolder of who they are and what they can do in the world. I um, did a leadership seminar for the women of Afghanistan in Kabul, which was really inspiring to see the courage uh, and creativity of the women of Afghanistan. And, you know, we here in um, the Western world have so many benefits and opportunities that I really do think we can help show the way. Uh, I've been working this past year uh, to focus on what mayors can do to uplift women so women in turn can uplift our families and communities. So it's held a conference in San Francisco and brought women experts and activists together with mayors from around the country. We had about 150 people there. And I'm writing up the report from that now. It's going to be a report on governing with a gender lens, what mayors can do to strengthen women and uplift our families and communities. So Mm -hmm. it's going to be very straightforward on here's what we can do to you know, strengthen women, particularly economically. A lot of women are struggling financially, so we want to help strengthen the economic foundation for women so women can bring the gifts that each woman has to share, as you talked about before, uh, you know, with less sweat and struggle along the way. Exactly, exactly. So are, <clears throat> are you planning to do another leadership summit for women? Is that something, or are you focusing on, on the, ma- the mayors of the country right now? Uh, right now, I'm focusing on the mayors, so I'll, that focus will continue until January. I'll be connecting with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. All the mayors in America will be coming to uh, Washington, D.C. in January. These are mayors with residents of 30,000 members or more. Uh, so I'll be carrying that work through then. And um, after that, I hope to do some more of the leadership seminars for women. It's really about helping women get in touch with who am I and what do I want to do with the next stage of my life. Yep. And uh, it's been great. Um, and I, I've also been doing a program, I call it Quantum Leap Networking, with different organizations. When you get a group of women together, it's a very um, uh, effective way to help each woman get clear about what her big dream is and get the support of the women around her. So I I recently did that for a group of Yale women here in Washington, D.C., and expect to be doing more of those also. Wonderful. And will that information be on your website if you're going to be offering something? 
I should be. Um, I'm, I'm not as good as updating my website as I need to be, but that's one of my, uh, yes, I hope to be updating the website so all that information will be up there. Good, because and then women, women can contact you and be part of what it is that you're doing. Absolutely, and I'm going to Iceland in two weeks. I've been invited uh, to moderate a panel up there. The women in Iceland are celebrating their 100 years of having the women's right to vote and reflecting on how they got there. And I thought, oh, my God, the Nordic women have made more advances for women than any other group of women in the world. So I want to learn directly from them how do they do it and then talk with them about next stage, what can we do to strengthen uh women now economically and you know stopping the violence and other issues that we're wrestling with awesome you know as you were speaking i was thinking about also mothers being our, the first teachers <clears throat> being the first teachers of our children and that brought me to thinking about education and your chapter three on education mm-hmm. which was one of my favorites in the book uh is it deborah meyer yes deborah meyer and I just love that chapter. Can you talk about the innovation in education that you're seeing? And I am sorry that that school has closed, not closed, but it's changed profoundly, um, the Central Park East. But talk about what she did and, and this model for education that I sure wish we had across the country. Right. Well, yeah, you know, in education is an area we absolutely must prioritize and focus on, and yeah. we still having dropout rates of uh, up to and over 50% in some cities across the country. So we we need to make sure that our next generation has a strong education to deal with the challenges and opportunities coming forward. So we all know a good education is the gateway to a good life, so we've really got to get this one right. And uh, the model that Deborah Meyer does is uh, really fantastic, and um, Deborah Meyer set up the Central Park East in Harlem, where 90% of the students graduated and then went to college, and which wow. is amazing. In uh, New York City, where the dropout rates were well over 50%, and I visited the school in its heyday there, and it's a fantastic model. Deborah Meyer then moved to Boston and opened up the Mission Hill School in Roxbury. Uh, an incredible school, same model, and that school is still going. Um, it's moved from Roxbury to Jamaica Plain, but still in Boston there. So, I, and my daughter ended up going there. I, uh, we adopted mm-hmm. a, a special child who needed a lot of help, and uh, she was in Deborah Meyer's school in Boston. And I'm telling you, it 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 may have saved her life uh, mm-hmm. because instead of focusing on you know, testing and punishing, which is kind of the MO now for a lot of education, they focus on each student and what is your interest area, where are your skills and ability. They noticed with my daughter Veronica that she was interested in nature and animals and bugs and and also carpentry and building things. So her teacher actually uh, built a carpenter shelf in the classroom so Veronica could do her projects and so forth well, uh, by building things when because she really struggled. She's very bright, but she really struggled with reading and writing. She couldn't read and write well until she was well into the fifth or sixth grade, but she had a lot to express, and she could express it through her hands, and they enabled her to do that while they continued to work on helping her with the reading and writing. And then they had the focus on the reading and writing was on on things that she was interested in. Mm-hmm. So, you know, have her learn about the bugs and have her learn about... Their, and one teacher brought in a parrot, so there was a parrot in the classroom and they learn about birds. And so it really was interdirected following the interest of the young person as opposed to saying, here's the set amount of stuff, we're going to shove this down your throat and you're going to learn it and you're going to be tested every three weeks on it. And mm. it was it was just such a more inspirational way of teaching. And really at the end of the year, I remember sitting there with Veronica the last day of school and the students were uh, upset because they didn't want to have summer vacation. They wanted to keep coming to school. Wow. <laughs> Wow, when do you hear that? <laughs> really? Yes, yeah, this is amazing. Never. <laughs> never. So how how do we take this model that Deborah Meyer uh, started with the Central Park East School and now the Mission Hill School that's changed a bit, but how do we get 
a school like this across America. And, and for instance, here in town, we have a charter school. And you did mention, I believe, in the chapter that these are sort of like charter schools because they are getting funding from the state and county here, in, at least the one in Santa Cruz, California, but they're, they're freer to be more innovative and students are learning with hands-on learning, as you described, and other, other ways and field trips and guest speakers and that kind of thing. But how do we get this model uh, into every state in the country? That is a great question, and um, one of the things we need to do is, you know, just following on your thread there, is, is to say that we really support public education because public education itself is under assault. There are yeah. people who want to turn education into a profit center, into a private enterprise, yeah. and that is that the charter schools are kind of a way that they're making that happen. Um, and, in fact, I got a call recently from Deborah Meyer herself, who's an amazing woman, and she got the MacArthur Genius Award for her work in education. Mm -hmm. She's now in her 80s, and she called me and she said, Eleanor, I want you to help me think about uh, what's the strategy for saving public education in America. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it really is uh, the whole of public education itself is under assault. And I think what we need to do is exactly what you're talking about, keep public education and relax some of the uh, stringent rules that they have. Like Deborah Meyer's school at Mission Hill is a public school, uh, but, but at the same time it had less restrictions and they gave it more flexibility yeah. in how the uh, principal and the teachers could educate, and they did the whole Mission Hill school as a Boston public school. And mm -hmm. that's what we need to do. We, that's how to do it. It's and not about creating charter schools, which are separate and you know for-profit models, which, by the way, are not showing necessarily any better results than the regular public schools, and they're doing the cherry picking and pulling off of you know from families that would probably do well anyway. But we want all our children to thrive, and that's the commitment of public education is that everybody gets it. So. One of the things is we need to stop this test and punish model. And, you know, yes, of course, we need testing to see where our students are. But this idea of teaching to the test or having the test be the only measure of whether a student gets promoted or whether a student graduates or how a teacher gets paid, it cannot be just through a test alone. We need a whole... Uh, a uh, smorgasbord of possibilities of ways of looking. What's the writing look like? What's the performance of the student over the course of the semester? What's the product that they're creating? And are they able to handle a level of work to go on to the next grade or not and not reduce it down to just one test score? So yeah. uh, moving away from a test and punish model is absolutely critical. And then the other way is, you know, similar to the Delancey Street model is the criminal rehabilitation model. For people who know about this uh, Deborah Meyer approach on public education, you can read the chapter in my book on education. It's like it take you 10 minutes to read it. You get the model and then bring that model to your local um, representative, your school board, yeah. and say, this model exists, the Mission Hill School in Boston. I want a school like this in our community, let's have a school like this. We demand nothing less than excellent education for all our students, and this is a way we can deliver it. Mm, wonderful. You know, the charter school here in town is uh, is not private. It's it, no, the, the parents and children pay nothing. So it's a charter uh -huh. school that is, that is um, completely supported by public education here in this town. And my granddaughter is actually in a Waldorf school in their town, and it is a charter school, and those parents do not pay those huge, huge tuition fees that most Waldorf schools require. So I, I think in some places we are moving toward this model. Right. Yeah, the thing to watch out with the charters, I love the flexibility on them. The thing to watch out with the charters is they tend to be pulling some of the better students away and then taking a lot of the resources out. And then they're leaving everybody else in the public schools, which are, of course, going to be performing less well because the better students have left. 
Yeah, um, yeah. It's not a, you're comparing apples to oranges yeah, uh, instead of apples point. to apples, which will give public education a bad reputation, and then they'll close those those public schools. So yeah, good point. I, yeah, we need to watch out for that and make sure that all of our students have, you know, good quality education. No, I agree with you. Here it's a lottery. So it's a lottery mm-hmm. to get in. And so in that way they got away from this, you know, sort of like taking the cream off the top and taking those students and looking at their test scores, whatever whether charter schools have done in the past. But this has been a total lottery here. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so that's how they did it because so many people wanted to be there um, and not just your top students, but students, for for instance, that weren't doing well um, and would maybe go to, uh, you know, a different school, but the kids there had a lot of behavioral problems or whatever, but they weren't functioning well and they need smaller, they need smaller classes and so on. So it was a lottery so that all the students who wanted to or the families that wanted their children to go could go. Oh, that's that's great. And um, I wanted to go to the Mission Hill School, by the way. It was so exciting to learn there. (laughs) (laughs) They did a thing where the entire school was studying ancient Greece at the same time. So it was grades, you know, kindergarten through eight. And they would deal with whatever level they were at academically, they would dive into ancient Greece. And they actually, in Veronica's classroom, uh, they turned the classroom into ancient Greece and said, okay. And Veronica, of course, was the uh, in charge of the military, so she used her carpentry bench and kind of made her sword and her shield and her helmet, and she was, you know, the general. And then they had other students would be the merchants, and mm-hmm. um, uh, others would be uh, the political leaders. So everybody had a role in, in the community. So they turned the classroom into a Greek city-state. It was absolutely amazing, and it was really fun, and they learned reading, writing, and math uh, as kind of a byproduct of learning about ancient Greece. And then the next year, they did the whole school was studying ancient Egypt. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my (laughs) gosh. I'd want to go, too. Really? They built a temple. They they did the whole thing. It was really incredible, and it, it's just such a fantastic model for education, and I hope we can create these models of the Mission Hill schools all over the country. That would just be such a gift to the next generation. Yes, and listeners, you can go to thebreakthroughway.com and be able to get this book. Breakthrough Solutions that Eleanor LeCain has written, and you can read about education, and you can take it to your local school board and change education in your community. So we have a couple minutes, Eleanor, and I wonder if you could summarize. I know I I love your last part of your book, your conclusion, where you tell people what the breakthrough solutions are. You, You break them down into steps and wonder if we could talk about, like, your first principle, focus on what you want, and just maybe, is it possible for you just to list the principles people can take away with them? Well, I think the main takeaway is to understand that as bad as things look right now, yeah. that actually those breakdowns are what's making it possible for breakthroughs and for changes to happen to create better ways of living together on the planet. And that uh, to have hope, to know that uh, change is coming, real transformation is already happening. And that our our challenge and opportunity as individuals is to look for that, to identify what is working, and to uh, amplify that and build on it. And I've you know, contributed my 20 years of research, which is in uh, the Breakthrough Solutions book, so that's a huge jump start for everybody can just know you don't have to spend the 20 years. You can read the book and yep. learn about these models, whichever one is of interest to you to take that. and uh, Or maybe you have another one. But yep. to, the, to keep a positive focus, be clear about what, we're, what you want in your own life and what you want for your community and for the country and the world. Keep focused on it. Keep working. Don't get discouraged as, as dark as it may seem that, you know, this is actually an incredible time of light. I believe there's light pouring into us now on the planet to help us to make this shift, and I believe we're going to have dramatic transformation in the country and in the planet 
within the next 10 or 20 years. Wow. I agree with you completely. And I love that you said, you know, focus on the positive, focus on solutions, and then take action. And I think that's uh, where we are right now. And Eleanor, thank you so much for being on my show. I just am so inspired by you. And I know you've inspired my listeners. Thank you. Thank you. You're a gift too, Sue. Thank you so much for all you do. You're welcome. And thank you, my listeners. Uh, You're so expansive, so open to change and finding your gifts. And you're willing to take action to help others on our planet. I know that about you. Next week, join me in welcoming Alea Dow, whose book, Seven Cups of Consciousness, is just the drink that we need. Until then, this is Dr. Susan reminding you that you carry the light. You've been listening to The Transformative Show, We Carry the Light, with host Dr. Susan Allison, the show that inspires you to find the light within and shine your light in the world. Who are you right now, and who do you want to be? What is it that makes you happy, helps you feel fulfilled, and living your purpose? Tune in every Thursday, 10 a.m. Pacific, and let Dr. Susan help you discover that you carry the unique light that only you can shine.